seen his work. I have watched his work. I have listened to him. I have worked with him. And so it is my plum pleasing pleasure to introduce to you this morning, Eric Adams. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to be here with you, Sister Jackson. And I agree with you. Uh, Tanya's uh, meditation was extremely important and it just really takes us uh, to a new place. Uh, God has given us so many methods of finding inner peace and I believe that it is time to have this integrated approach uh, to spirituality to allow us to find those moments when we can go inward and use all of the gifts that God uh, has given us. And it is part of the conversation today, and I cannot thank you enough uh, for uh, really looking at the health of the full personhood of individuals. Oftentimes, uh, we turn over our health uh, to just the medical professionals without realizing they're part of our health team. And as I reflect on my life, uh, there have been many times that I was in what one would consider a dark place, uh, only to find out that I was not buried, I was merely planted. And mommy told me when I was a child, she said, son, if you're fortunate to live long enough, you're going to be unfortunate to experience pain. The question becomes, how do you turn pain into purpose? And I've lived through that in my entire life. Uh, from some many painful moments, from being abused by police officers as a child, then later joining the police department and started 100 Blacks in law enforcement who care and became a clear voice for police reform. Some of the things you're seeing uh, today, uh, embracing politics to go into changing laws in Albany and now becoming the first person of color to be the Brooklyn Borough president. But one of my most darkest moments came uh, four years ago. I was out of the country at the time uh, when I was experiencing pain in my stomach. I thought it was colon cancer because I just lost a good friend to colon cancer. And you know men, you have to basically drag, drag us to the doctor whenever we feel as though there's a pain, we try to just shake it off and ignore it. Uh, but this discomfort was just so persistent uh, that I knew I had to go get it checked. And so when I came back to the country, I decided to go to my internist. Uh, my internist sent me to have my colon and my stomach checked to determine what it was. And when I came from under sedation, uh, the doctor stated that, Eric, your colon is fine, but your real problem is your diabetes. Uh, your diabetes is at a coma level and you are in serious trouble right now. And he said, in fact, I'm surprised you're not in a coma. My A1C was high, a normal a A1C is around 5.6. Uh, mine was up in the high teens and it was frightening. And because of that, I was experiencing vision loss. I lost my sight in my left eye and I was losing in my right. I had permanent nerve damage in my hands and feet that he stated could lead to amputation and he felt that the vision loss was going to lead to permanent blindness. Also had high cholesterol, high blood pressure. My PSA numbers were high as well. And as well as the original reason I went to the doctor, I had an ulcer uh, that was causing the discomfort. And so I was in pretty bad shape and I looked fine on the outside, except for a few pounds that I put on. But for the most part, I, did, I needed to take an internal selfie. And I went to five of the best doctors here in the city, in Brooklyn and throughout New York. And they all told me the same thing. They said, Eric, there's not much you can do at this point. I walked in the doctor's office that day with no medicine. By the time I walked out, I had medicine for my eyes, medicine for my blood pressure, medicine for my cholesterol, medicine um, for the diabetes, uh, three different medicines. Uh, one was insulin and metformin and some other pills. 
And so by the time I left that doctor's office, I felt as though I was a miniature Dwayne Reed with all of the medicines that I had to take. And I was just not believing. Something inside me said the devil is a liar. And I remember sitting down at the computer, placing all the medicine next to my laptop. And I decided to go online. There was a group of pamphlets that the doctor gave me. And he was a, a conscientious, a very polite uh, internist. And after all of the doctor visits, they gave me pamphlets. And the pamphlet stated, living with diabetes. And I went to the computer that day and I typed on Google search, change one word. Instead of living with diabetes, I typed reversing diabetes. That one word sent me down a different journey. And information came up with doctors many of you have never heard and I never heard of before. Dr. Gregor, Dr. Barnard, Dr. Esselton, and other great doctors who were talking about this new pathway in medicine of reversing disease and not living with disease. And I started reading through the information and became excited of what I was seeing and I couldn't believe it. I said, how could something be truthful that we're not being told by anyone in medicine? In all my years of going in and out of doctor's office, I was reading something entirely different. And I decided to call one of the doctors, Dr. Esselton. He was the same doctor that treated Bill Clinton for his heart disease. I told him who I was and I would like to have an opportunity to see him. And he stated, Eric, you can fly down to see me and I will give you the information you need. And I did just that. Got up early in the morning and flew to Ohio, uh, the Cleveland Clinic. And I spoke to Dr. Esselton that morning. And he says, Eric, if you change your diet, it's possible you could reverse uh, your diabetes. And I remember looking at him and saying, here I am losing my sight, going blind, and he's telling me to give up chicken. What's wrong with this guy? But I had nothing to lose. And I immediately returned to the city, went through my refrigerator and my cupboards, and started reading the labels. And I saw that everything there consisted of the food he was talking about, all processed all filled with sugar, oil, a lot of salt. Nothing was healthy. And I just took a big <clears throat> garbage bag and just started emptying everything out and throwing it away and just started a whole food plant-based diet. And parishioners, within three weeks, three weeks, my eyesight came back. Within three months, my nerve damage went away. My diabetes went in remission. My blood pressure normalized. My cholesterol normalized. My PSA normalized to a 1.1. All of the conditions that I felt was I was dealing with went in remission. And remember that ulcer that sent me there in the first place? One day I just woke up and didn't feel the discomfort anymore. I couldn't even tell you if it was a week, two weeks, three months. It just disappeared. No medicine, only food. And my mom called me and said, son, I've been watching you and reading what you're talking about. I would like to stop taking these nine medications and insulin. I'm tired of injecting myself like this. Mommy joined me on this journey. And within two months, she was told by her doctors she could stop taking her insulin. She was diabetic for 15 years and seven years on insulin. And she was able to get off her insulin based on changing her diet. It was never our DNA. It was our dinner. It's not your lineage, it's your lunch. It's not where you're born, it's your breakfast. We were poisoning ourselves every day by what we were eating. My entire siblings have now joined me on this journey of real health. 
Each one of them are dealing with some form of health care crisis. One sister lost her breast to breast cancer. Another sister lost a kidney to kidney failure. Another brother is going through prostate issues. All of these diet and food related diseases that we are daily consuming. Each time our body would like to heal, we stand in its way by our knives and our forks and what we put in our mouths. And trust me, it was challenging in the beginning. The first week I thought I was going through withdrawal. I thought I was someone that was addicted to heroin because I was waking up thinking about food and dreaming about food and started to do more research. And I realized that the same pleasure senses of the brain that you get when you take an addictive substance like crack or heroin is where you get the sugar addiction from. And food is addictive just like that. In fact, I'll challenge you. You put someone in one room that's hooked on heroin or crack cocaine, and then you put someone in another room that's hooked on the food that we eat every day and take it away. And I challenge you to tell me who's hooked on the heroin and who's hooked on the jerk this, fried this, sugar this. We're all addicted to the food in the same level of prayer and meditation and dedication and commitment and appreciating the gift of life that God has given us is going to take for us to get over this. And there's something really significant when you think about it, about the African-American experience. We are eating the food that our ancestors were forced to eat on the plantation. The slave master must be looking down and saying, look at them. Although we lay in our graves, we were able to successfully pass through the recipes that would be, what would be destructive to the communities to come. Slave masters must be saying, I don't have to worry about Eric Adams being the first African-American borough president. He will be blind at the age of 55. I don't have to worry about Ken Thompson being the first black district attorney. He would be blind. He would have colon cancer and die at the age of 50. John Lewis, a noted warrior for black civil rights, walking over the Pettus Bridge, being attacked and survived that, but the food related diseases that ate up his body and took him from us prematurely. You do not die from these diseases because of your age. We die from these diseases because of the food that we are consuming. Even the study that my doctor friends that I have coordinated with are showing us how those things like dementia and Alzheimer's, we used to think that they were related to when you get older and they're not. They're related to the same food that you eat. It clogs the arteries of your heart, clogs the arteries of your brains. Food not only causes Alzheimer's, heart disease, diabetes, but believe it or not, it also caused incontinence. It also caused erectile dysfunction. It also causes arthritis. It causes all of the ailments that your body continues to break down. But here's the joy. For the most part, it's reversible. Just as my vision loss was reversible in three weeks, just as my diabetes went in remission in three months, just as my nerve damage went in remission, just as we see all those who are finding a new source of life and a new vitality is because of the reversibility that is associated with the new pharmacy. That's not spelled P-H-A-R-M-A-C-Y, but F-A-R-M-A-C-Y. It's the food. There's nothing wrong with you. There's something wrong with the food that is saturating our communities. In the park slopes, in other areas, they have whole food, but in our communities, we have junk food. Block by block, neighbor by neighbor, street by street, we are saturated with those fast food chains that are poisoning our children. That's why I started my initiative to get processed meat out of our schools, and we were successful in doing so. We also have an amazing program at Bellevue Hospital, the first of its kind in America, that is lifestyle medicine. 750 people are on the waiting list 
Over 200 people are in the program and they're watching themselves reverse their disease, get off their medicine. This is a major calling that I believe must start in our faith-based institutions. When you look at it, one of the most unhealthy places we know is when we go to congregate and worship our Lord and Savior. Thanksgiving Day, we sit around the table and give hope and prayer to our aunts and uncles and loved ones who are in the hospital, yet we carve up the same food that put them in the hospital in the first place. Our hospital continue to serve unhealthy foods. You go into the hospital for colon cancer, as soon as you leave, the surgery, you meet in your room the same food that caused the colon cancer in the first place. That is this mission. And it's about not talking down to each other or demonizing or beating each other up. It is out of love. When you go to any healthcare facility, you should have options. Just as you have options on which surgery you're going to go through, you should have options on what type of care. And if you decide to do a whole food, plant-based lifestyle care, you should receive the support that you need. You should, be, you should be instructed on how to shop, what to look for, what are the proper foods you should eat, how to make your food tasty and enjoyable. I enjoy my meal every day, never hungry, never lacking the various taste sensations that I look for. If it's making, my own frozen dessert made out of frozen bananas and chocolate and natural peanut butter. Or if it's making my own stew or my own burger, burgers, lentil burgers, or making my own bread made out of flaxseed and oat flour. There's so many different meals you can take and enjoy and make and see how the pleasure of eating healthy and enjoying the sensation. I believe food must look good, it must taste good, and it must be good for you. So I say to you, let's change the definition of soul food and have food that's good for the soul. It is something that God has meant for us to do. It says that we should be fruitful and multiply, not toxic and die. And that is what we're doing. You know it more than I. You know many how many people that sat next to you in our church pews are now going through moments of uncertainty. You know how many times you visit loved ones in hospitals. We deserve better. And that's why I wrote this book, Healthy at Last. It is a book, I don't know if you can see it, <laughs> but it's, it's a book that you can make available if you desire. It's called Healthy at Last, uh, a very important book about health and giving you the true measure to plant-based lifestyle. What are the benefits? What are some of the recipes? This is the first time I took pen to paper and decided to become an author because it's important that just as I save my mom's life, I want to save the lives of the moms who have prayed for me throughout the years, who have nurtured me and spent time with me. I remember when I was a police lieutenant and someone shot at my car. The next morning when I woke up, there was a group of mothers at my home laying hands on my home and just praying for me. My community has prayed for me throughout the turbulent periods when I was in dark places. And because of you, I was able to turn those dark places from being a burial to a planting. And the fruits of this harvest of health is something I want you to also share with. Be healthy at last. Live a healthy lifestyle. If you know someone in your family who's going through heart disease or diabetes or some other ailment, let them know the information. If you are personally going through this, Share the information and read it. Read my books and other books that talks about disease reversal. That's the new conversation. Have your doctors become part of your health team. They must advise, not control. They don't teach nutrition in medical school. They treat pharmacies and how to write prescriptions. 
We must move from sick care and finally get to health care. That's the journey we could be on together. So I thank you again for allowing me to join you this morning. And I say to all of us, let's be healthy at last. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Eric, for sharing. And the book is entitled Healthy at Last. I hope yes. you can see that. And you know, I have read most of the book and I'm a person, I have a lot of books on health. Um, and, but this book is a really great book. And what I wanna to say to our congregants this morning is that this book is filled with rich information, rich information, information and history on the foods that we're eating, the history of soul food, the politics of food. There are resources in there. Um, there are recipes in there. It speaks to medical support and there are actual cases in there of people and what they've gone through and how they have reversed what the medical situation that they're going through. It also affirms, and this is something that a lot of other books I haven't seen in other books, it affirms that people work at their own pace that they begin it at their own pace. Not everybody can go cold turkey. Not everybody can empty out their pantry or empty out their kitchen, but that you begin at your own pace. Even if it means one day a week having a meatless Monday, you can begin at your own pace and become conscious of our health and what we're putting in our body. Everything in life begins with a decision. <laughs> It begins with a decision. It begins with a mindset, a consciousness, a made up mind. So once we make up our mind that we're going to be healthier than we already are, that we're gonna be more conscious of how we're living and what we're eating, we're on the right track. We're on the right track. Eric, can you, sp I have two questions. Can you speak a moment? Um, to the, the situation of diabetes in Brooklyn. It's my understanding that the rate is very high of diabetes in Brooklyn. Is that accurate? Yes, it is. It is extremely high. And we actually have our own brand of diabetes called Flatbush Diabetes. Uh, it is all uh, is extremely alarming. And we're, we're seeing children get diabetes at a younger and younger age, a lot of the uh, health issues that were normally isolated to adults, they're now to impact our young people at an age that is really alarming. And here's a number that I really find troubling. 70% of 12 year olds have early signs of heart disease. That is something that we really need to be concerned. Remember, heart disease is our number one killer. And 70%, 70% of our babies have early signs of heart disease at age 12. Uh, but the diabetes issue is an alarming issue and it's not sustainable. Of uh, you know, 30 million Americans are diabetic, 84 million are pre-diabetic, and we're spending 80 cents on a dollar on chronic diseases in America. This is not sustainable. Mm, thank you, thank you for addressing that. That's important information to know and, and to work towards and to share with other people. I have one other question. Can you tell us um, how, and we've been talking about, I've been talking about the census for the last couple of months and the important, uh, importance of participating in the census. Can you just, uh, share with us how the census is connected to the healthcare system and the equipment that's in the community. Oh, so true, and that's a great question. Uh, the census, when you fill out the census, it gives an accurate count of how many people are in your particular municipality, your particular uh, city, state, and neighborhood. That is how we determine the dollars that will come to your community. And right now we're only at a 54% rate here in New York City and the borough of Brooklyn in particular. So that means instead of getting an entire dollar, 
we would get only 54 cents on the dollar. Imagine going to your home, uh, going to your job and each week, instead of you get receiving your full paycheck, you're only getting 54 cents on the dollar. You're getting on, only 50% of what you earn. You're unable to purchase the things you need. And so because of the lack of dollars we're getting in our, in our city, we're unable to purchase the medical and healthcare equipment that we need, particularly for this safety net hospitals. Those are the hospitals that treat the poor, the Kings counties, the downstates, uh, the uh, Brookdales, all of these hospitals, interfaith, these are safety net hospitals. So if we're not receiving the resources we deserve on the federal level, it's not coming down into the state coffers and it impacts. And, and you saw during coronavirus, 90% of the people who were admitted to hospitals had comorbidities or pre-existing conditions such as respiratory, asthma, heart disease. And over 90% of the people who died had comorbidities in pre-existing conditions, and the hospitals uh, were unable to give the proper services. Really, the, you, it depended on your zip code if you were gonna live or die in coronavirus, and that is true in many of the chronic diseases that we are facing. So we need everyone to fill out the census. It is imperative that our faith-based institutions uh, encourage people to fill out the census, don't let Donald Trump beat us. He attempted to have a citizen question on the census. You don't have to be a citizen to fill out the census. Uh, they attempted to do everything that's possible, change the date uh, to not allow it to be extended because, because of coronavirus. They want to keep the numbers down because we will lose congressional seats and we will lose the funding and it will impact our health care. So don't surrender, let's show that we believe and let's fill out the census. Thank you, thank you so much. And one last question, uh, is your book available now? Uh, it's, you, could, you can pre-order, it's on Amazon, it's going to be out in October, but you can pre-order it now through Amazon. We're also going to have an audio book that's available. And I believe during uh, the various seasons that are coming up for Thanksgiving, uh, give it out to the family members for Kwanzaa or Christmas, uh, give it out for the family members. We, we, we made it affordable. It's more important to us, the information is out. I am making no money off the book. The book is going to go into a nonprofit that is going to assist faith-based institutions build out health ministries. That's where the money is going. Uh, we want all of our faith-based institutions to have health ministries uh, to incorporate the power of prayer and the power of daily uh, affirmations on making the mind, body, and soul healthy. You know, because again, as you stated, and as I continue to say, it's not about looking at what Eric did to say, I must empty my cupboards, I must do all, everything all at once. Uh, it's about finding your space and gradually taking one step at a time towards the success and bringing your family uh, with you. That is what it's about. And that's what the book is really showing the history, how to do it in a slow, slow manner, and how to develop your full spiritual personhood. And don't beat yourself up. There are good days and bad days. Uh, there are days that you're going to uh, make a mistake, make an error. You may eat something that you're not supposed to, but that's the beauty of life. Uh, remember, for 55 years, I was beating my body up, and my body still was saying, I'm going to be here when you're ready to turn around. And with the help of our Lord and Savior and the power of prayer and the power of meditation, I was able to do so. And so you can find this book. Um, you can pre-order through Amazon, or it will be out in October to receive your copy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, I began my whole food plant-based journey. Uh, Thanksgiving will be five years. Wow. And there were times when I fell off the wagon. <laughs> I fell off the wagon. Um, and you just have to get up and dust yourself off and get back on the wagon and get back to it and get going again. 
So I thank you for sharing that. People should not beat themselves up, but just get back up and keep That's on right. going. Yeah, so, I, so before right. you leave, I want to bless you, and we all want to bless you this morning for coming and sharing with us this, this information that is so valuable, so rich. And so, Eric, we love you. We bless you. We appreciate you. And we thank God for you. And we behold the living, loving Christ spirit within you. And so it is. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Namaste. Namaste. And we hold you in prayer as you continue to do the work. Thank you. Peace Take and care. blessings. <laughs>